Hey everyone, welcome to the Love Six Scribe podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. And if you're new here, I'm Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Six Scribe. Today we are going to be talking about a passage in Luke chapter 19. And the reason why I'm going to be talking about this is because last week in the blog post that I released, I talked about taking notes, being a good Berean, and we talked about some of the scripture that has been taken out of context or misunderstood and trying to understand it in a more biblical way and shedding light on that so that we can have a better understanding and that we can honor God in the proper understanding. And one of the things that I mentioned in the blog post that I wrote and even said in the podcast is that it's really important as a believer in Christ that we take notes when we're in corporate gatherings, when we're listening to teachings, that we're taking notes, that we're opening our Bibles, that we're following along and that we're reading we're, and we're being students of the word, that we're making sure what we're being taught we have a proper understanding of it and that what we're being taught is following along with scripture. And so in holding with what I told you, I wanted to share just a few of the notes that I took from Sunday's sermon two days ago at, at our church. In this message, the reason why I wanted to share on this because was because the whole focus in this message that was presented to us in church on Sunday was essentially to talk about the gospel, to talk about how the title was The Gospel Makes the Difference. And there were two examples that were used. It was in the, at the end of Luke 18 about the beggar that was healed and was acknowledging Jesus as the son of David, a messianic title, and that he was healed. His sight was given to him and because of his faith in Christ and that he went around praising God and others praised God because they saw what happened. And then as you go into Luke 19, you hear the story from Luke 19 verses 1 through 10 of the story of Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector which chief tax collector, and when I've looked in my study Bibles after this sermon, it's the only time that this is used in, in the New Testament to describe Zacchaeus. Regardless, the tax collectors were not viewed in a positive light in their culture. Some of the notes that I took, it, it caused me to um, go back and look at them and to reflect. Now, you may be wondering, why was he ministering the gospel in the church? It, uh, isn't everyone in the church saved already? Well... That's a great question, and it's a and it's an interesting thought because when you look at the, for example, the history of the altar call, uh, and I've looked into this, and I'm going to share some things here in a particular blog post that I found. I'm sure there's other things that you can find as well, but there are some thoughts on that uh, from the time that the altar call was formed, which was done under Charles Finney, and during he was the one that actually coined the term revivals. There were people that came forth that made decisions for Christ to altar calls. They were invited up, and many of us, including myself, are familiar with this, and I know this is a side note from Zacchaeus, but we're going to come back to Zacchaeus in just a moment because I think it's important that we understand that the gospel is for both the church to hear, for believers to hear, to continue to be reminded of why Christ has saved them. And it's also to understand that not everyone sitting in a seat in a church is saved. That there are some that that may be under the assumption, well, I prayed a prayer, uh, I made a decision for Christ, I filled out a card a long time ago, or I answered an altar call, and um, it's a done deal, I'm saved. And there's no fruit, there's no keep bearing with keeping with the, fr the fruit of repentance that um, Luke 3, 8 talks about. And we're going to see this in Zacchaeus, that, that he is bearing fruit that is keeping with repentance, um, that that scripture is talking about. You know, we have all of us, myself included, and, and I'm the product, quote, product of an altar call. Uh, many of us can say that. But it's not the altar call that saves us. It's Christ that saves us. And and it's the understanding that God is the one, the Father is the one that draws us to the Son, that we don't make a decision for Christ, essentially. That, that the Scripture helps us to understand that God is the one that's doing the work in us and, and helping us to have our hearts softened and to give us ears to hear and eyes to see. He's the one that hardens hearts. He's the one that softens hearts. And so there's a lot of different areas that we could talk about about that. I trying not to go in on many different rabbit trails, but it did get me thinking about the decisional, uh, for the decision for Christ or the altar call or saying the, the sinner's prayer, or sometimes we think, well, I'll just share my testimony and this is what's going to save people. 
And though our testimonies are, are valuable, um, they can encourage people without the gospel being ministered to people, meaning the talking about specifically the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, talking about the wrath of God, talking about the need for a Savior, which is sin, rebellion, um, that there is judgment that comes if we don't acknowledge that we have broken God's law, that we've broken His commands, that, we, that we've rebelled against Him, and that we need a Savior. And Jesus Christ is the Savior. He's the one that atoned for our sin and he also satisfied the wrath of God and he fulfilled the judgment that we deserved and so now in through faith in him and repenting and uh, by faith in Christ alone that we become co-heirs with Christ and we're given the promise of eternal life we're justified before God the Father because of Christ when our faith is in him alone and that our righteousness is now his righteousness is clothing us so that we can stand before the father and be justified all this to say it, it really got me thinking when i was hearing our pastor talk about this because i thought it was so good to be able to hear the gospel in the church and to hear it applicable in the scripture and showing this is the reason why and giving an opportunity to say you know, if there's anybody in here that maybe you think that because you just made a decision, but you're not bearing the fruit in keeping with repentance, that you're hearing the gospel now in order to recognize that so that God can minister and do his work that he does through the scriptures. The scriptures are left for us and they're sufficient and they're to help us to understand who God is and understand the way to salvation. And we are also as Christians supposed to minister this to other people. So the gospel was presented Sunday as far as the gospel making the difference and focusing on Christ essentially. Luke 19 that we'll we'll start with it was Luke 19 1 through 10 and I want to read this to you and I'm going to read out of the ESV and you may hear some crinkling in the background it's because I am old school and I, I do like my de, um, electronic devices but I am a paper kind of girl. I like to highlight and I like to underline and I like to mark up my Bibles to where I can uh, be a student and go back to them and, and reference them when I'm trying to, to do some studying on the Scripture. So let's read Luke chapter 19. You can follow along with me in your own Bible, starting with verse 1. Okay, Jesus, uh, he entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be a, the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost." I thought it's so it's such a beautiful thing and even at the end I was hearing I listening to a sermon last night about this and and doing some studying and more preparing and and wanting to talk about this on the podcast today and again I, I enjoyed so much Sunday hearing that message that it really it it caused me to go even more into scripture and and to look further and that's what we should be doing as believers uh, when we're hearing the word of God taught in it properly in corporate gatherings, it should spur us to go into the word even more and be students of the word and want to dig in and to see what's going on here and to see other scriptures that are applying to this. And And so I'm going to share that with you today and share a few other things. I was listening to a sermon last night for a little bit about this particular passage. And this one minister was talking about at the end of it in verse 10 that his, his focus in there was that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And talking about how God is the one who seeks us. He's the one who saves. And I think a lot of times we forget that aspect as well. Is that we're thinking, oh, I'm going to seek God in, these, in, in this and I'm going to do all these deep things. Or I'm, uh, I'm the one that is strong in the Lord and, and God needs me to you know, do A, B, and C. When really, when we get back to the basics, we have to understand at the core of our faith that 
Jesus Christ is the Savior. He's the victor. He's the champion. He's the one that is the focus. We're the ones that are needing saving. We're the ones that are lost initially. Um, and that, that we are the ones that he has come to seek and to save, those that belong to him. He's seeking out. The Father, again, John six forty four. I encourage you to read that. John six forty four says that, um, that no one comes to the Son unless the Father first draws him. So God is the one that's doing the work in us. And then when we are, uh, when our faith is in Christ and that we are born again and that we believe in Christ and we, uh, we're co-heirs with Christ, then Ephesians also tells us that we are God's workmanship, that we, when we understand that it's by grace alone, that no man should boast that we are saved, then we begin to understand after that, that we are God's workmanship, that we are created for good works. So the good works don't save us, but the good works testify to whom we belong. And so that we are saved for good works, not by them. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that too with, with Zacchaeus, because you're going to notice something that he did. And some of you may be thinking, or maybe have heard in a, in a message before someone say that, it, that they focus on what Zacchaeus did. So with that being said, let's talk about Luke 19 verses one through 10. Now with Zacchaeus, we know that he was a tax collector and we know that he was a chief tax collector is what I've mentioned a minute ago. And that he was not very, uh, not held in high esteem uh, to his people. That's a nice way to say it. He was not held in high esteem because of what he did as a tax collector. They were known as being underhanded. They were known as basically being traitors to the Roman culture, to the Roman government, because they were collecting money from people. And what our pastor was also saying, too, was that the tax collectors also collected more than what they were told. And so it makes it clear in these passages that, he is rich. He's a he's he's, the, he's very rich, and this is probably <laughs> highly likely the reason that Zacchaeus is rolling in money is is what how we would view it today. And Zacchaeus, though, what's interesting, Zacchaeus has heard of Jesus, and it's it's easy to see why he's heard of Jesus and the other people as we see even prior to these accounts in Luke and even in Matthew and Mark and the four gospels essentially Matthew Mark Luke and John we see that as where Jesus is going which is a small area by the way just as a side note when you begin to look up where Jesus ministered it's a very small area and had a tremendous impact because of being the son of God and what he did and then he sent out his disciples to go and do greater works than he did, not in quality, but in quantity. Okay, John 14, 12, because I know that's another passage that I probably could have used last week out of, that's taken out of context. But John 14, 12, when he, he says, greater works will you do than me because I go to the Father. Again, that's talking about the Holy Spirit coming, and he's going to send out his disciples to do greater works than he did, meaning the gospel is going to be multiplied across the world rather than in the geographical, the small geographical location of what Christ did while he was in his earthly ministry. But still, it's his ministry that's going all over the world. It's not our ministry. It's his. So when you look at Zacchaeus, you're seeing that this man, who's a chief tax collector, he's a sinner, not because of his job, but because his, of his unrighteousness. He is doing things that are sinful against people, against God, ultimately. But yet he's heard of Jesus. And so he does what he can because of his short stature. He gets up in a tree. He wants to see Jesus. Now, I, we don't know. We, we, we can only assume from the text that he's not only heard of the, the, the miracles that have taken place, because, of course, when uh, Jesus is nearing Jericho, he heals this blind man. And then he, when he enters Jericho and he's passing through, we hear of Zacchaeus. We can assume, you know, we, again, we can't see this from this. We can't read into the, read this from the scripture, but we could likely assume that obviously Zacchaeus has heard of Christ. He's heard of Jesus Christ and he's getting into the tree to see him. He's heard potentially the miracles. But another thing too, is that we know from the time after Jesus was baptized in Matthew four, that Jesus went around going, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Meaning that Jesus was the son of God. He was truly God, truly man. He was in the earth. The kingdom of God was available to the people then to repent and believe in Christ, that he came to save the lost sheep of Israel first and foremost. But we also know that the gospel was opened up to the Gentiles. And we can see this time and time again. It's, it's revealed in the Old Testament. It was uh, shadowed in the Old Testament and uh, hidden in the Old Testament, and it was revealed in the New Testament. And so we see Zacchaeus, he's, he's wanting to see Christ. He's wanting to see Jesus. And so he gets any way he can 
He climbs up in the sycamore tree and he gets up in there to see Jesus. And as he ran on ahead of the people and climbed in this, this man that is a wretched sinner, (laughs) these people that could not, that hated, that probably hated Zacchaeus. This man gets up in a sycamore tree to see Jesus. And as Jesus is passing by, he comes to the place and he looks up and he says to, to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. Now, Jesus didn't ask if he could stay, but he invited himself to stay in this man's house. And Zacchaeus hurried, came down, it says he received him joyfully. Now, some uh, study Bibles say that that using the word joyfully could imply that he had already received salvation. Again, we don't know, but he was willing he was looking forward to this and says, when they saw it, they all grumbled. Of course, that, that happens, doesn't it? Because there were Pharisees or Pharisees or Sadducees or scribes that were constantly grumbling. They were complaining about things because their hearts had been hardened, their eyes had been blinded, and their ears had been stopped up. They could not see before them that Jesus was the Son of God. And that was that was God, for one part, that was God fulfilling Scripture because God fulfilled the scripture through these people by Jesus being crucified for the sins of the world, for the sin of man. And yet we see as we go on that he's gone in to be a guest to a, of a man who is a sinner. And see, see, these people are not getting it. And the, it's like the lack of self-awareness is, is deafening when you think about this, because we're all sinners. That, that's the hard thing about this is that these people just did not get it. But Zacchaeus was willing uh, he wanted he wanted to see Jesus and he was willing he was joyful about Jesus coming into his home and Zacchaeus obviously we can read from the text that Zacchaeus recognized this in his own life that it says in verse 8 that Zacchaeus stood after this was this was said it says Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord behold Lord the half of my goods I give to the poor and if I have defrauded anyone of anything I restore it fourfold and Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, I want to point, point out something here. For one thing, and this is something I, my, our pastor pointed out, was that, and I mentioned this a minute ago, Zacchaeus referred to Jesus as Lord. And that is a title that was reserved for God. So he, re, he referred to Jesus as Lord. He is acknowledging Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And that's one part that we cannot leave out. Jesus is our Lord. When we know him as as our Savior, he's also our Lord, that we are subjected, we are submitted to him, and that we acknowledge that he is our King, that he is our Lord, that we answer to him. Another thing that was really important, though, uh, that when I was doing some more Bible study on this, too, is that we see in the, in the chapter previous, the, the prior chapter in, in Luke 18, Jesus is talking to a rich ruler. And the rich ruler is talking to him and he refers to him as good teacher. Now, that, that's what's interesting, too, is that he doesn't refer to him as Lord. He, he refers to him as good teacher. So notice that difference, okay? This is a rich ruler. This is in verse 18. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And... Jesus, you know, kind of rebukes him and says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And this man says, you know, I've done all those things and I've kept them from my youth. And, and when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. So all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And that we know that the man was very, uh, you know, he was saddened when he heard that because he was extremely rich. And Jesus said, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. And, you know, Peter, of course, goes on. He talks about, you know, we've left everything because of you. And and Jesus says, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. So how is this even tied up, you might ask? Well, because when we see this in Luke 18, we can see that this is encouraging at the fact that 
Zacchaeus is showing he's at first of all he's not calling Jesus good teacher he's calling Jesus Lord and he's acknowledging him as his Lord and Savior and it shows that even a wealthy man what is what is impossible with man is possible with God so we also see in Luke 5 that this was and by the way this was not the first time that Jesus had dined with a tax collector a quote sinner by the way again we're all sinners (laughs) We have to be, we must keep that in the back of our minds is that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there's nobody that's arrived and there's nobody that's in sinless perfection. And if they try to tell you they're in sinless perfection, you need to not listen to those people (laughs) because if they've, if they've arrived, then they're, they should be in their glorified bodies already. And it's just not possible. Uh, Even after, uh, as a believer, your flesh is going, you're going to sin. So we're all sinners. That's just as a side note. But what, there's a difference is that we don't want to habitually do it as a lifestyle is that we want to ever be conformed into the image of Christ. And the only way that can happen is through being uh, being led by the spirit and not by the flesh. Another topic for another day. But Luke 5 actually talks about uh, when we talk about verse 31 and 32. Specifically, we see an account in there where Jesus is uh, he called Matthew, recalled Levi to follow him, and uh, this tax collector did follow him. And and Levi made him a great feast in his house in verse 29 of Luke 5. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick... I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And that's why I wanted to focus on with that was the end of verse in verses 31 and 32 is that Jesus makes it very clear. He didn't come for those who are well, who think that they're already righteous or that they're already, they've already reached the pinnacle in righteousness, but he equates sin to being a sickness. He says, I, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick Sin is a spiritual sickness, and we even see this in Isaiah 53. And actually, we can turn there. If we turn to Isaiah 53, we can see this, that it is using word, uh, the the verbiage that indicates it's a sickness, that sin is a spiritual sickness. Uh, Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is sickness. That is spiritual sickness. And when Jesus is saying in Luke 5 that people don't, that they are in need of a, physi- of a physician, and that he came to be a physician for those who are sick, that it's sin. He says, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So what is Zacchaeus doing in Luke 19? He is, he is answering the gospel. Now, again, we don't know from the text what Jesus said to him in his home. What we do know is, is that he acknowledged Jesus as Lord. On top of that, we see that he is holding to Luke 3, 8, which Luke 3, 8 will turn there so I can read that to you. So you can see that as well or read that as well. You can't see it through a podcast, but you can read it along with me. This is John the Baptist when he's ministering in verse 7. He says, he said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So we even see that Zacchaeus is referred to by Jesus Christ as he is a son of Abraham, which he's acknowledging that he is descended from, from there in physically speaking, naturally speaking. But Zacchaeus is bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. He's not one of these people that thinks his own righteousness is going to save him or that his money is going to save him. Whatever was said in that house between him and Jesus or what he even heard, like I said, he potentially could have even heard the message that Jesus was saying from the time of his baptism, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel is ministering and testifying of Jesus Christ. It's testifying that he is Lord and Savior and that he is the only way to salvation. He is the only way to the Father. 
And the Father, it looks like, based on John 6, 44 also, and I know I'm putting a lot of scripture in here, and I encourage you to look all of them up and to read them even, and, and to read before them and after them to get more perspective. But one of the things that really ministered to me even coming out of the movement I was in was John six forty four kept sticking in my mind. That was one of the several scriptures that kept sticking in my mind was, no one comes to the Son unless the Father first draws him. I don't know why I kept fixating on that passage, and it still sticks in my mind. But it's almost comforting to think, well, I didn't do this. God was the one, the Father was the one that drew me to Christ. Because I'm not, if, if my understanding is correct, um, I'm not going to choose Christ. I'm going to choose sin. If I'm left to my own devices and I let f- my flesh rule and I do what I want to do, then I'm going to still walk in the ways of the first Adam. I'm going to want to do what I want. I'm going to rebel. I'm going to sin. And I'm going to choose that every time because I'm going to love the sin more than I love the Savior. And I'm going to love the love that more than I love the one I have to call Lord. And when I have to call Jesus Lord, then I'm acknowledging I am no longer the, the leader of my life. I've heard people refer to themselves as a CEO of their own life, uh, sir or ma'am. Let me just tell you right now, if you have that thought, if you have that belief system that you are the, the CEO of your own life and you say that you're a Christian, I would encourage you lovingly to get back to scripture and to realize you are not your own. You are bought at a price and you're to glorify God. You don't belong to yourself. I don't belong to myself as a believer, a professing believer in Jesus Christ. I didn't come to Christ and simply because of answering an altar call. It was because there was conviction. There was a pricking in my heart of knowing I have sinned against God. I need a savior. I am wicked. I am unrighteous. I have sinned against a holy God. There's nothing good in me apart from Christ. I need a savior. I need the savior, not just a savior. I need the savior. I need Jesus Christ to cleanse me from all my unrighteousness And to be the high priest that I need that's ever interceding for me before God the Father. I need the Savior. I need to be cleansed and made whole. I need to no longer longer be an orphan. And praise be to God, as a believer in Christ, he, He makes all things new. He cleanses us. He clothes us in his righteousness. He justifies us before God. The Holy Spirit comes and he dwells within us to make a home within us, to lead us, to guide us, to conform us to the image of Christ, to correct us. And his word helps us. It it rebukes us. It corrects us. It reproves us. It instructs us. It encourages us. It testifies of Christ. And Zacchaeus, from the beggar in Luke 18 to Zacchaeus in Luke 19, the gospel truly did make a difference. Zacchaeus having a lot of money didn't mean didn't matter any it didn't matter to Jesus. This was a man that true salvation had come to his house. How did uh, he know that salvation had come to Zacchaeus's house? Because Zacchaeus was bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. He was willing to go back and to repent before the, before people and to also make things right. And not only make things right, but I want you to notice something. He was he was wanting to to help the widows, and he was willing. He said, if I've defrauded, he wasn't just wanting p- to pay back what little bit it was. He wanted to restore it beyond what he had stolen. I mean, this was the level that this man understood, that he had sinned against God, he had sinned against these people, and that he acknowledged Jesus as Lord. He acknowledged him and said, Lord, I'm submitting to you, and this is what I'm going to do. And Jesus' response is, it wasn't because he prayed a prayer. And again, I don't want people to get upset with me about that, because there are people that, in in some of those instances, it is genuine that people have not only prayed a prayer and asked Jesus and saying, please save me. In those, some of those instances, there are people that are truly saved, but also, too, it's not just because they prayed a prayer and then they went on their merry way and they went on with their life and nothing changed. See, that's the thing is that there, there is change that takes place when the true gospel is ministered. And it's not, I'm not talking about a change in five minutes that, or that lasts for five minutes and then you go, oh, okay, I'm good. But no, this was an, a change that this man, he, he was willing to to no longer be considered a rich man. 
in, in the sense of physical or material ways. He understood that his spiritual riches were in Christ. And so he pledges to restore this money in multiplied form. And so what can we learn from all of this? Why, why am I sharing this with you? Well, it, it just stood out to me because hearing this, again, I don't think I can say this enough. I think sometimes that we, that we tend to think as Christians, well, the gospel's for the unsaved. The gospel's for those that haven't yet heard of Christ, which, you know, I would remind you, and there's some people that say, well, Jesus could return at any time. But when you're even talking about the gospel being shared, just to put this in perspective, not even in the Western culture, because quite frankly, we in the American church, we tend to think that the Bible is about the American church, and it's not. <laughs> it's not centered on the American church. It's not centered on the United States. We are not at the, we are not at the center. We are not, it's not orbiting around us, okay? And I know that that may be a, a trite thing to say, or some people will say, well, I know that. But there are some people that don't acknowledge that. They believe that the Bible is centered around the United States or the American church, and it's not. The, the Bible was centered around Christ, first and foremost. But when you even look at, for example, on the Joshua Project, um, and on their website, joshuaproject.net, this may put it in perspective for you as a global summary, an overview of the people groups of the world. Um, there are 17,410 people groups. The unreached groups are 7,398. The percentage of unreached groups is 42.5%. So some people will say, well, everybody's already heard the gospel, right? Everybody's already heard it. No, they haven't. Not everybody's heard the gospel. There's p billions, 3.28 billion people that are unreached. The population is 7.84 billion. The percentage of unreached is 41.8%. Not everyone has heard the gospel. And I will tell you this, not everyone has heard the gospel in, in, the, in the Western Hemisphere. And that is... That is a shocking thing to even think about and even say. But there are people that are even sitting in churches that have not heard the gospel. They've heard a version of the gospel. They've heard the prosperity gospel, or they've heard someone just give their testimony. And again, I'm not diminishing testimonies because testimonies are encouraging. They encourage us because they show the mercy of God, the grace of God, the, the faithfulness of God, the love of Jesus Christ. They show they, they, they show that, but that's not the gospel. Our testimonies are not the gospel. The gospel is based on what scripture testifies of Christ, of what he's, what he's done, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and telling about the call to be born again, the call to be saved, to acknowledge that we are sinful, that we're rebellious, that we're not good, and that we can never be good without God. One that some of the things that our pastor said Sunday that, that really stood out to me that I, that I jotted down was is the gospel is not about being good or doing better. Some of us are like, well, yeah, <laughs> but even, I, I mean, I was sitting there and I'm, I'm sitting there in my seat and I'm thinking to myself, I need to be reminded of this. The gospel is not about being good and doing better. And sometimes we all think that and we'll think, well, if I just attend more church services, if I just, you know, do what this leader is asking me to do and do it consistently, if I just do, if I just do this, if I just give more, if I just do all these things, then God will love me more and I will be pleasing before God. And please understand me when I say this. Again, the scripture tells us that we were in Ephesians 2, it tells us that when we are in Christ, when we understand that it's by grace alone, but by faith in Christ, it's, it's not of, of anything that we can do that we can boast in so that no man can boast, but it's by grace. It's the work of God in us that we are saved. And then in verse 10, it goes on to talk about for we are God's workmanship. We are created for good works. And we understand that we're not saved by good works, but that we're, that we are created for good works. And then, you know, we read in James and we think that James contradicts Ephesians 2 when it says faith without works is dead. It doesn't contradict because when you show that you have these works, then again, it's not the works that save you. It's you're showing something in me changed. I can't be the person that I used to be. I can't go back and, and be that person any longer that was rebellious against God, that was hostile to the spirit, was hostile to the things of God. I can't be that person anymore because God has done something in me and he saved me. He's made me into a new person. He's given me a new heart. He changed up my heart of stone for a heart of flesh to where I don't want to do the things I once did. 
And again, that's not sinless perfection because we're all going to sin and fall short of the glory of God. The Holy Spirit will convict us and that he will, he will help remind us of what the word of God says and he will help to remind us and, and to conform us to the image of Christ, to lead us and to guide us and that we are instructed by the word of God. But the gospel is not about being good or doing better. This is not about Zacchaeus being good and doing better. Zacchaeus was not good. None of us are good. I mean, Romans 3 even talks about none of us are good. We talk about, you, you'll hear people and they may innocently say this, but they'll say, well, you know, that person, so-and-so is a good person. No, they're not. <laughs> Nobody's good. We may want to do good things and mean to do good things, but we're, none of us are good. None of us are righteous. None of us, none of us do good. No one seeks for God on their own. That's what Romans, again, Romans 3 says that. There's little nuggets in there that you can see. It's all God's work in us when he's doing this. It's all God's work. We can't take credit for this. And you striving and thinking, well, if I just do this and this and this, God is going to love me more. And if I do more, if I do better, then, you know, and that's one, another pet peeve of mine when I hear people say, we must do better. Well, I kind of get what they're saying. And I've heard a lot of people say that. We must do better. Again, when you're striving in that, that you feel like you're just not doing enough or that you need to do better for God to love you, then we're not understanding the true gospel. And then it becomes works-based salvation. And then we're, we're not doing things under the Lord because we know that we were made for good works to glorify God. We're doing things because we think we're going to get something from God if we do more. And that's not, that's not the gospel. The gospel, uh, another note I wrote down here was the gospel changes the heart, not just the outward behavior. There's an inward work that takes place. And this is what happened with Zacchaeus. There was an inward work that took place in him. He recognized his sinfulness. He recognized um, his utter need for the Lord Jesus Christ, and he recognized his error, and he wanted to acknowledge that error. Not that 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 writing the error brought about his salvation, but Jesus recognized because something inward changed in him that his outward behavior was was showing that was demonstrating that. And of course, Jesus knows what's in the hearts of men. At John three, it says that Jesus did not need for any man to testify of him because he knew it was in the hearts of man. And the heart is deceitful and wicked apart from God, by the way. Yes, God knows what's in our hearts. When we say that God knows my heart, well, he does. He certainly does. He knows your heart. He knows my heart. And our hearts are deceitful and wicked apart from God. They cannot be trusted, but we can trust Christ. And he knew that Zacchaeus's heart had changed because there was an outward demonstration that that inward change had taken place, that outward demonstration was coming forth of going, I don't want to be this wealthy person anymore that's, that's underhandedly taking from people. I'm going to, to handle this the way that the, the Lord uh, would, would want me to handle this and demonstrate that, that true repentance has come to me and I'm bearing fruit in that according to Luke 3, 8 in keeping with repentance and I'm understanding I'm made for good works, God's workmanship, and that I'm going to demonstrate that I belong to God in doing what's right. Not so that God will love me more, but because I want to honor God in that capacity to, to testify of him. There was another, an, another quote that he said, too. He said, the heart is where the gospel takes root and grows. I, I, that is s- such an encouraging thing to think about is that when we, when we sit there and we, when we think about the gospel, what it's supposed to do, and the gospel, again, is not just for the unsaved. And I think that that's something that all of us, myself included, have to get in our heads and in our hearts also. We must understand the gospel is not just for the unsaved. The gospel needs to be heard every time that we gather in some capacity, in some way, shape, or form. We need to understand the gospel even as a believer and remind ourselves of the gospel. From what have I been saved? To whom do I now belong? What can we see in the scripture that testifies of the gospel, that's pointing to the gospel? Both in the Old and New Testament, we can see this. We can see over and over and time and time again that the gospel is the one that's being pointed to. What are we to devote ourselves to? The gospel. What are we supposed to proclaim as believers? The gospel. You're supposed, we're supposed to proclaim the gospel in some way, shape, or form. Whether and it, You need no title to do such a thing, and nor do you need to be an evangelist. And that's one uh, misnomer that has been applied in saying, well, evangelists are the one that actually proclaim the gospel. No, everyone is, as a disciple, is to proclaim the gospel. And if we wait on a title to do that, 
then we're going to miss opportunities to be obedient to God in sharing the gospel with people, even those that are saying that they're brothers and sisters in Christ, and encouraging them in what the Word of God says, and encouraging them in their faith of the gospel. The gospel is not just for the unsaved. And yes, that is the first and foremost thing that ultimately what was happening Sunday was that there was an opportunity basically with presenting the word for those that would say, well, maybe I'm just going through the motions. Well, maybe I'm just trying to do better and acknowledging, you know, maybe I don't know Christ. Maybe I've been one of those people that sat in a pew for years and years and years or a seat for years and served and find all of a sudden one day I'm sitting in a corporate gathering, hearing the word of God being ministered and the heart gets softened and conviction comes. And I'm not talking about someone that goes up continuously for altar calls and things. Um, I say this with in, in love, and I say this as someone who's been a part of these movements where people have gone up consistently, up repeatedly, over and over for salvation. If you have the same person coming up for salvation then we need to be sitting down with that person and explaining to them what the gospel is. Because sadly, there are people that will do that, that consistently think that they must go to an altar call in order to be saved. And they're doing it every few weeks or, or they're doing it, uh, you know, once a month or every six months or once a year because they think, or they don't understand, they don't have a proper understanding of scripture and, and the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And those people really need discipleship. All of us need discipleship. And that's one of the biggest things too, um, that I, I wanted to mention because I was looking up and I'd looked it up quite a while back, but I had looked up about the decisional repentance, about the altar call, and was looking up a little bit about the history of Charles Finney, which I I was familiar with him, and about how he was the one that had initiated the altar call and the term revivals, the, the meetings, the corporate gatherings of revivals. And there are some interesting quotes from Charles Finney himself that even at the end of his life that... Uh, According to this one blog post, it says that he rejected the fruits of his altar calls. He said, I was often instrumental in bringing Christians under great conviction and into a state of temporary repentance and faith, but falling short of urging them up to a point where they would become so acquainted with Christ as to abide in him, they would, of course, soon relax to their former state. And there are other things that are that are mentioned that people talk about how there were so many that came to the altar calls, but then when they would come back months later, they would find that these people, it was like a dog returning to its vomit. They were, they were not regenerated. They were still, there was no fruit in keeping with repentance once again. Um, And another alarming thing that I came across too, was that there's a statistic from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association that says that there is a high rate of apostatizing, a 90 plus percent, uh, according to the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. So they've even recognized that in in the Crusades, that out of thousands of people that come forth, there's a very small percentage of those who are truly regenerated, who are truly born again. And again, this is not to disparage people that have gone up for altar calls. And I hope that people are hearing me when I say that. It's to get you thinking. It's to get you thinking and not just say, well, it's based on what I did. I answered an altar call. I prayed a prayer. I filled out a card. I did this. I did that. But the question is, what change has taken place in you within you because of the gospel? And that was the question that our pastor asked is that, has your heart been drastically changed by the gospel? Because again, that's where the gospel takes root is in your heart. That's a question for all of us. And I'm in that, I'm, I'm in that lump as well. Has the gospel drastically changed you inwardly to where you hate the things you once did, or there's something that you still are struggling with and that you need the Holy Spirit to help you. You need God and, and you, you cry out, God have mercy on me help me. I don't want to do this. Uh, Or those that, that, um, that don't know Christ and they don't understand that there is that salvation, there's salvation alone in Christ alone, that he's the only one that can wash us clean, that can save us from the judgment of God, because he took upon him the judgment. He took upon him the wrath of God and that those who believe in him, then he's paid the penalty. He's paid the He did not pay the devil. He paid the penalty of sin on our behalf to God the Father, who is a just God. 
He's a just judge. He's not a judge that's that's not going to issue a verdict or issue a sentence for sin. And yes, he's a loving God, but he's also a just God. He is not one or the other. He's both at the same time. He is just and he is loving. And if he was not a just God, then we would call him corrupt. If, if he did not deal with sin, if he did not deal with, with evil and wickedness, if he did not give a sentence or give the punishment or the consequence for that sin that's, that's not atoned for under the blood of Jesus Christ, we would call him a corrupt judge. But he's not corrupt. He's a just God. And his justice is seen, his, his uh, wrath is seen on the cross, his love is seen on the cross, his mercy is seen on the cross, his justification, and, w- and then we see all of this even after the death, burial, and, res- and the, into the resurrection. Now we're seeing the promise of eternal life. We're seeing hope. We're seeing the, the joy of being with God forever. When we put our faith in Christ alone, when we answer the call, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and that we recognize that there is an inward change that must take place, and it's not just saying a prayer and going along our merry way, and then we think that we're okay. It's kind of like the mono- when you play Monopoly and you get the, the j- get-out-of-jail-free card. This isn't simply, well, I'm escaping the fires of hell, and that's, that's the goal. That's not the goal of Christianity. The focus of Christianity is Christ, salvation, eternal life, it's coming to understanding that He is the only way to the Father. He is the only way. My daughter and I are working on Bible verses every week, and some weeks we have to work on the same one. John 14, 6, when she's memorizing some. John 14, 6, we've been working on this for a few weeks. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the only way. And it's not just simply saying the words out loud. It's There's an inward change that takes place because God is doing the work. He is doing the work taking out the heart of stone and and putting in the heart of flesh, the heart that will be circumcised, that will be set apart for him, the person that will be set apart, the man or woman that will be set apart for Christ, that will, that will serve him, that will, that will listen, that will submit to him, that will, that will testify of him, that will glorify him in their lives and all in word, in, in word and deed. Not because they feel like they, can, they have to do something in order to earn it, but because they recognize something in me has changed. I can no longer, I'm no longer the person that I am because of Christ, and I've got to tell of him. You know, even when I look at statistics in the Barna group, I would encourage you to look at that. You look at how many people, one in, one in uh, four Americans is a practicing Christian. When we're looking at the American church, one in four Americans is a practicing Christian, and that's of 2020. That's as of 2020 of last year. And you, you see the, the rates of, of uh, weekly church attendance that's dropping, and you see the, uh, how, many, uh, how often people are reading the Word of God uh, weekly versus daily, which the daily amounts are far lower than they are for weekly. Uh, I think it ra- averages around 11 to 12 percent, uh, actually it's 14 percent as of 2019 versus 12 percent in 1999 for reading the scripture every day versus someone who never reads it as, as, as a professing Christian is 35 percent. And those things are not encouraging, but what is encouraging is, is that there are believers in Christ who are um, continuing to wake up and they're continuing to come back to the Word of God and to the things that matter and, and coming back to their first love, coming back and, and people that are even, you know, maybe even thought that they were saved for years and then realize based on what scripture says, not on what someone else's testimony is or their personal experience or anything, but when they go and they measure their life against what the Bible says, what the word of God says and it, and what it, how it testifies of Christ, then they begin to see, wow, I'm in despair. I, I, I am in trouble and I'm, I'm in need of a savior. If I don't know Christ, I'm in trouble. And that I, I want to leave you with that is that that should be the place that we go to in order to minister the gospel, is the word of God. Yeah, I can share my testimony all day long, and I can share it twice on Sunday. And my testimony is going to encourage some people. But if I don't share the gospel along with my testimony, and I don't tell people, and, and I basically just put it out there of how awesome I am, and look what, and you know, how, look what God did for me, and all this, and, and I'm 
you know, people argue and say, well, you're still testifying God. Yes, but th- that's not the gospel. So I can tell people my testimony of what God did, but I need to also be ministering the gospel according to scripture. And, and testifying of Christ, pointing back to him and what the word says, so and minister and proclaiming the gospel. That's the call, repent and believe. And then God does the work. And that goes against a lot of what many of us think, is that we have to, we are the ones that save people. We are not the ones that save people. God is the one who saves people. We are faithful to God. We minister the word of God. We proclaim the gospel. And from there, God is the one that does the work. God is the one that softens hearts. God is the one that opens people's ears. Just like he hardens people, he hardened Pharaoh. God is the one who softens people's hearts. God is the one who opens people's ears. God is the one that opens people's eyes. You know, I think about my own testimony of coming out of the movement that I was part of. And for 18 years, I think, why didn't I see? Why was I so blind that I couldn't see some of the things? Again, not everything was error, but there was a lot of stuff in there that was error. And not being able to see, not being able to understand fully. And then one day it was like the lights came on, boom, out of nowhere. And it was from misappropriated scripture, oddly enough. But God's word doesn't come back null and void. It was a salvation passage, actually, that was not used as a salvation passage in John 10, 27. But God's word does not come back null and void. It serves the purpose that it was intended to do. And what did it cause me to do? It caused me to go into the word and it caused me to ask questions. That's part of my testimony and that's all well and good. But if I don't share the gospel along with that and say, Jesus convicted me of my sins. I was, I realized that I had sinned against him, that I really, that I needed to uh, turn, turn to Christ and to repent of what I had done and to to realize that I had been in error, that I had been wandering. I was a wandering sheep. And I heard the, the voice of the shepherd through the, the scripture in John 10, 27. And I recognized that I was to follow him. And that is the only way to God is to follow him, is to repent, to recognize your sin and rebellion against God and your need for a savior, that you are not righteous. There's nothing in you that's righteous or good. You are valuable, but there's nothing righteous or good in you, but your value is found in Christ alone. And in order for you to have the promise of eternal life, you have to recognize that Jesus died for your sin. He died on the cross for your sin. He took the, he satisfied the wrath of God on for you so that that way you could be reconciled back to the father. And the only way to be reconciled back to the father is to repent and believe in Christ alone to save you from your sin. And without that salvation, you perish. Without that salvation, you are under, you are condemned already. But the call is repent and believe. We love people enough to tell them, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe that Jesus was, was died on the cross and was raised from the dead. We cannot forget the resurrection because that's the promise. That's the glorious promise and hope of eternal life. As believers in Christ, we are called to proclaim the gospel. Believers need to be hearing the gospel and reminded of what Christ did. And then also, too, you never know. There's going to be someone in there that that hears the word um, differently, that there's a there's that moment in time where God is doing something in that person's heart and they begin to to see things in a different light. And then they go, I've I've been something in in title or in name alone, but I really there's not been an inward change in me. Having said all of that, um, I hope that this has been a blessing and if you want to message me at all, by the way, uh, you can message me at dawn at lovesickscribe.com. I use, I will get those emails. And uh, if there's, uh, if I don't know the answer to something, or I feel like that there is a, di- a much better, if I feel like there's a much better resource, then I'm going to guide you in that direction. Uh, because there are some really great resources out there, especially for people coming out of the, the movement I was part of, that are available to you, that are going to be extremely helpful to you and help to get you back to guide you in a, a specific direction, a good Bible, biblically sound church that are going to help you in the, in the healing process of some of the, the things that you've come out of, some of the abuses and such, and uh, false teaching. So please feel free to message me, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can between life going on and then the messages I get and uh, all the other irons I have in the fire. But until next time, guys, I look forward to, to talking with you and sharing with you and glorifying Jesus Christ in the process with you all. Be blessed. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at Lovesickscribe. 
And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to lovesickscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and we continue to grow together in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.